Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I couldn't be more excited to launch the 2021-22 Great Lecture Series. And this year, for the first time, um, we're actually offering this series uh, for your safety in a hybrid uh, format. So whether you're joining us here in person or online virtually, um, I'm thrilled to welcome you back to the museum. Now, museum work is um, at its core about telling stories. And this year's lectures focus on the timeless stories of great revolutionaries outstanding leaders who brought dramatic change to their societies. These leaders include the first king to unify Egypt, a queen of the British Celtic Iceni tribe who led an uprising against the Roman Empire, and a leader in the, in the current quest for Native American rights. These stories are fascinating, powerful, and at times transformative. And they're particularly relevant today as we navigate and seek solutions to unprecedented challenges. In this way, the Great Lecture Series opens up another way in which we try to make archaeology and anthropology accessible to all. Now, this evening's lecture is no exception. We will get to know a leader from 5,000 years ago who claimed to have reformed his society and we'll examine the motivations and uncover who really benefited from his reforms. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce my colleague, Professor Steve Tinney, our guide to this great revolutionary. Steve Tinney is the Clark Research Professor of Assyriology, Associate Curator of the Babylonian Section of the Penn Museum, Director of the Pennsylvania Sumerian Dictionary Project, and Deputy Director of the Penn Museum. That's a lot of jobs. Steve holds a BA in Assyriology from Cambridge and a PhD in Assyriology from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. His research interests include all aspects of Sumerian language, literature, and culture. And here I must point out as a, a Sumerologist myself how incredibly seminal and influential Steve's work has been in the area of Sumerian literature, particularly for our understanding of the ancient scribal curriculum. That is the sequence of texts and educational processes by which student scribes first learn to read, write, and advance through their scribal training. Steve's work has spurred a raft of dissertations, giving rise to one of the most dynamic and vibrant areas of sumerological research today. Much of Steve's current work is devoted to online editions of Sumerian texts and to analyzing and presenting the Sumerian language as part of the Electronic Pennsylvania Dic Sumerian Dictionary, known as the EPSD a project which is of absolutely fundamental importance to the field of Sumerology, Sumerology. And he began working on this when he joined Penn in 1991 as a postdoctoral research assistant and which he today directs. EPSD is itself part of a much larger project which Steve also directs, an international collaboration which goes by the name ORAC the open, richly annotated cuneiform corpus. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Steve Tinney. Well, uh, thanks very much, Chris, for that uh, very kind introduction. And uh, welcome to all of you who are in this magnificent auditorium again, um, and to all of those who are joining online, an equally warm uh, thank you for being here. Um, so I wanted to say a few words about my choice of topic before we really get into things. Um, you know, great revolutionaries has a certain connotation in our uh, contemporary perspective of people who've kind of changed the world against the odds 
um, affected long-term change. Um, it's usually not anonymous. It's usually uh, in, associated with particular individuals. And that presents quite a challenge when you're working with ancient Mesopotamia, because when I was asked, you know, what would I talk about for great revolutionaries? You know, if I look over the span of history, the fact is that in the written record, uh, any real revolution, anything other than people rebelling against whichever king currently wants to be top of the pile, has been excised. And anybody who actually dared to create some kind of organized resistance to the massive programs of forced labor that characterize Mesopotamian society has been anonymized and eradicated from history. So there may have been people who did these things, um, but we don't know them. Uh, the best we have is a handful of comments in administrative texts which mention people who fled from the workforces, Zach. So I fell back on kind of a standard in the field, and uh, if you've Googled Urukagana's reforms, you'll see why. Um, you know, he's got quite a good reputation in social media, uh, or at least, you know, on the internet generally, as somebody who effected some kind of change. And certainly rhetorically, uh, that's what it looks like, and we'll get to that later. Um, but I'm not sure, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure that he ranks as a great revolutionary. Um, but he's interesting, and I have a real soft spot for the places he comes from, uh, Lagash and Girsu, uh, which sometimes I think are underrepresented in our history books for various reasons. Um, so I, I decided to talk about Urukagina, um, even if maybe I secretly I think is a little bit of a stretch. So here we are in southern Iraq. Um, we're dealing with the third millennium BCE. We're roughly dealing with, let's say, 23, 2400 BCE. Uh, chronology is quite difficult in this period. There are several conventional chronologies. Um, and uh, we're down primarily in the south. Um, I'm told if I use the pointer, maybe people viewing online can see it. So here is Lagash on this map. Um, down here, and it's surrounded by the famous cities of early Mesopotamia, uh, Uruk, Ur, Eridu, Nippur. Um, all of these places are well known uh, in various contexts and have been widely written about. So here's another view. This sort of focuses in more on what we call the early dynastic landscape. And again, uh, you have this, ooh, 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 be careful with the pointer. There we go. Um, you need more and more manual dexterity to work these things the older you get. And I'm not quite up to the task sometimes. So Girsu and Lagash form kind of a twin cities thing. Uh, they're, they're polities that are closely related, cities that are closely related. Um, it looks like Lagash might be an older and slightly larger ceremonial city where Girsu is the administrative center. Um, and so when we talk about Girsu and Lagash, typically we're pretty loose about which one we mean. In fact, almost all the texts I'm gonna show you come from the site of Girsu. Um, but in, in the native uh, parlance, they use both Lagash, which is the modern site of al Hiba, very large site, um, which is currently uh, not exactly currently, but currently part of a research project uh, led by uh, Holly Pittman at Penn. Uh, they were excavating there pre-COVID, and they're already planning to go back as soon as possible. So we look forward to the new discoveries which might come up there. And Girsu, modern Tello, um, there's some important recent work being done there by a British museum project uh, under Sebastian Ray. Um, you'll see a few figures from a recent and, and very handy book of his. And they've already found some very interesting material related to the Gudea period at Girsu. And I'm sure that if they are able to work there longer, um, they may enhance our knowledge of the early dynastic period as well. And in the ancient texts, they call Lagash Girsu Kilagasha, the land of Lagash. Uh, Urukagina is purely conventional. 
Uh, the signs, Uru and Ka, at least, can be read several different ways. And there's a fair amount of ink has been spilt and uh, reputation sullied in arguments about which is right. I plan to stay well out of those arguments today and simply use the conventional Uru Kagina. And I put here Ningirsu because Ningirsu is an incredibly important figure from the divine realm. Ningirsu means Lord of Girsu. And uh, Ningirsu is really the god whom Urukagina is aiming to please and serve. So, for those of you who've heard me talk at these great lectures before, you know, normally I have a good yarn to tell. I'm talking about mythology. I don't quite have that this evening. Um, but I do have kind of a historical yarn to spin. And the historical yarn needs some framework. And typically, our framework for ancient Mesopotamian history comes from one or other of a variety of king lists. And there's an extremely important king list called the Sumerian king list, which purports to give the kings in sequence uh, of the ruling cities, each in turn, over the period before the flood until something like 18th century BCE, something like that. And this really gives us our our, our skeleton that we, we flesh, flesh out with our other history. And the start of the king list really begins, um, there's a pre-Diluvian part, but I'm not going to bother with that tonight. After the flood had swept over and the kingship had descended from heaven, the kingship was in Kish. Kish is a city, a very important city. Kingship is a thing that the gods can hand down from heaven and take back and which can be taken away from you by invading armies and so forth. And I'm not going to read this whole thing. You'll see that uh, 23 kings ruled for 23,000 plus years. There's a fantasy element to these very early phases. Uh, but interestingly, this figure, Enmen Baragesi, as it appears in this text, probably is a historical individual. Uh, where there is one mace head which is inscribed Mebarasi, which is probably a version of this name. Kish was defeated and the kingship was taken to Ayana. Ayana is an expression for Uruk, House of An. And I put this up here because if you read down, almost at the end, down here, uh, Gilgamesh comes in. So in the Sumerian king list, Gilgamesh, who of course is a, an epic figure in the first millennium BCE in a much later period and features in a number of Sumerian tales, uh, is clearly placed within the realm of you know, human, mortal kingship. Although at the same time, the tradition understands he's two-thirds God, because why not, right? So here we're getting a little bit uh, less radical. 12 kings ruled for 23, 10 years. <clears throat> now I'm gonna gloss over this. I'm not gonna bore you by reading it all. What I've done is I've abridged it so that all of the names of the kings and the years they reigned and the totals are all omitted. But this is the full sequence of the transmission of kingship um, from the dynasty of Gilgamesh down through various dynasties of the city of Ur, which is well known to all of us, of course. Awan, Kish, Hamazi, Uruk. Uruk was defeated. Um, Ur, Adab, Mari, Kish, Akshak, Kish, Uruk, Lugal, Zagezi. He'll come back later in this. Then Uruk was defeated and the kingship was taken to Agade in Agade Sargon, whose father was a gardener. The cupbearer of Urzababa became king, the king of Agade who built Agade. He ruled for 56 years. So the king list likes to do this from time to time. It presents uh, hereditary succession from father to son as normative, but it has all sorts of notes about tavern keepers and various other people who managed to become king. But one thing that is not in the king list um, and it's not the only place, is Lagash, or Girsu. Ki Lagasher, Lagash and Girsu, are completely snubbed by the king list. But because of the excavations, we know that's not really fair. So here is a beautiful and very meaningful uh, work from the reign of Urnanshe. And Urnanshe is, for the sake of argument, the first ruler of Lagash, whose name we are certain can be associated with kingship in Lagash. He has simple brick inscriptions which say simply, Urnanshe, king of Lagash. 
But this is much more complex. And one of the reasons I started with it is because just because Lagash and Giyosu aren't in the king list doesn't mean to say there was anything sort of backwater about them. Um, they have, right from the get-go, all the paraphernalia of the kind of Sumerian uh, royal behavior and ideology that we see in later things like the Gudea cylinders and in our own Middle East galleries, the Stele of Onama, which is very closely related actually to the scene on this, even though it's, what should we say, 500 years later, four to 500 years later. Because this little plaque um, <coughs> shows Onanshir twice. It shows him once in the top left-hand corner with a basket on his head. And it so happens that we know exactly why he has this basket on his head. We know from various texts, including the Gudea cylinders, that one of the roles of the king was to make the first brick of the temple. And when he's making the first brick of the temple, he's shown in this pose with a, with a labor basket, a corvée basket on his head. And what is in that basket is the clay to make the first brick. And the first brick is the heart of the temple. We know from very late texts that the first brick, the brick of fate, um, had to be given special treatment. And I'm talking about 2,000 years later, two and a half thousand years later from Wananshe. We don't know that all of these things were static over time. But in the very late ritual text, they say when you go to rebuild a temple, you have to find, you have to go early in the morning, take a silver saw, go find the, the, fate, the brick of fate, the first brick, and cut it out of the building and then take it to one side and put a veil in front of it and sing lamentations in front of it the whole time you're building the new temple. So this little image of the king with the basket on, the he on his head really encodes this entire belief system about the royal role in building and the proximity of the king to the gods and the correct and proper building, the proper ritual building of the temple. And you can see his name. Um, up here, this star, just to the right of the brick, we call this dingir in the trade. It's the sign for God, and it precedes God names. And this symbol here, which is actually a, a shrine with a fish inside it, is the sign for Nanshe. Nanshe liked fish, so that's her symbol. And then down here below it is Ur. So it's written a bit back to front. In these very early texts, it seems that they maybe write kind of the, the, the topically most interesting component, and then other components, so the god is perhaps topically the most interesting component. Um, you will sometimes hear it said that the writing order is kind of random, but I don't think that's really true, and I think many people don't think that's true anymore. <coughs> so what's happening in the bottom scene? Well, in the Urnamastila, which is a big, fully worked version of this motif, what happens is first the king builds and then he banquets. And then what's in the bottom right-hand corner there is Onanshe again, and he has a nice drinking cup in his hand. And after all his labors, making the first brick and building the temple, he's relaxing with a well-earned drink, as so many of us would, right? And these little guys around him are his children, mostly his children. They, mostly they have this sign here. This is Dumu, child, Dumu, child. And it's Onanshe and his children depicted both uh, before uh, or during the building and after. So this is a very early, very important sort of uh, microcosm of an entire belief system. Here's another one. This is much bigger, uh, less complete, obviously. Uh, this is what we call in the trade the stele of the vultures. And it's associated with another ruler called Aenatum, also of of Girsu. Um, you can see here an attempt to reconstruct the pieces and lay them out over the, you know, the framework of a traditional uh, Mesopotamian stele or Sumerian stele. Um, this is Aenatum in his chariot uh, with his soldiers behind him. Here is kind of a phalanx of Girsu soldiers. There's a lot of uh, military exploits described in the royal inscriptions. And what you're seeing above the soldiers is a text. And the text actually discusses the way that uh, the enemy broke an oath and how 
uh, Ea Nasum got the god Ningirsu to make them keep the oath after all. This is why we call it Stelia the Vultures. Okay, we have these, uh, this, what you're looking at here, in case it's not obvious, quite good for Halloween actually. Um, this is a skull and a rib cage. These are vultures picking over the bodies on the battlefield. Very graphic. Now, we don't have anything like this that predates this object. That doesn't mean there weren't other things, but it may be novel. We don't, we don't know. The detail, not so interesting for this presentation. But here, this is interesting because this, this is something you'll see at the very end of the talk. Um, you'll see this motif reprised in a different context. Um, but this is the god Ningirsu, and he's holding a net, and the net of the enemies contains the enemies of Aenatum. So this is a, a, an object which demonstrates the king's victory in battle with the help of the god, and it also uh, sort of represents the need to maintain your le legal obligations. You know, there's a great deal of uh, justification involved in these things as well. So I'm not going to dwell on this a lot, but the, we can sort of create a little Lagash Dynasty king list uh, from documents like the ones I've been showing you, brick inscriptions, and we also have several thousand uh, administrative texts from the rule, reigns of some of these rulers, which I'll talk about just a little bit in a moment. Urukagana is the last of this dynasty, this dynasty that we call the Lagash I dynasty. And purely for the sake of orienting you, since some of you may have, you know, be familiar with Gudea, Gudea is in the second dynasty of Lagash, the last dynasty of Lagash. Also not in the king list, I should say. So, this cone of Urukagina, um, the reforms, this is the best preserved example um, there are seven fragments and cones with this text. They seem to represent several different versions of the text. Um, we're not very clear on what the archaeological context of them was. Uh, the 19th century excavations at Tello uh, were not very attentive to the architectural detail, um, but the new excavations done by the British Museum um, in 2015-ish uh, were and they, they're finding things that obviously the, the original excavators left behind or didn't realize were there. So there's a lot of promise to understand that better. If they find more examples, uh, we may find some in, in situ, in, in the original location. Probably where these belong is in deposits that are laid in temples. Uh, they may be in little brick boxes under the doorways. Um, they often are. And they're not really intended for humans to read. You know, with, with these documents, we're always thinking about who are they for? And these are really intended for the gods to read, probably. And maybe, you know, for their own scribes, their own, their own intellectual elites around the king. Um, it's made of clay. Uh, I think it was probably intended to sit on its flat end, to the right end, um, even though it's shown here lengthways. Uh, we, by convention, we tend to reorient inscriptions so that the writing goes from left to right. Um, I think probably, uh, this is a lot clearer, right? Um, I think probably the original orientation is with the shortest column at the top and the longer columns going down the edge. This is a hand copy, a drawing of the signs. Um, and I put this here really just to, to try to start to reassure you that these things are legible. Um, and in fact, they're very legible compared to tablets written a few thousand years later when they crushed the signs all together. And this is the first column, the shortest column. Um, it starts off uh, at the right-hand edge here. This is, I'm, I'm sure Chris is uh, either arguing in his head about whether this is right or thinking, yeah, that's right. And I'm not going to ask him which one right now. Uh, we deliberately oriented in the Middle East galleries the inscriptions, the early inscriptions in this way. So you have to read them from the top down and right to left. Um, because some of them are certainly oriented that, in that uh, direction in their original usage. So this is actually very simple, the way it starts off. And you know, I have my, my current students in Sumerian could, could read this um, here. So this is the, the star again, Dingir, Dingir Ningirsu, Ursang, Dingir Enlilara, 
before Ningirsu, the hero of Enlil. And then here's Urukagina. Urukagina, Lugal. This is a person, um, Lagashak. And then he's building temples. Egal Tirash Munadu. He built for him the Egal Tirash, the great house Tirash. And then towards the end of the column, uh, Antasura Munadu. He built the Antasura. And then a house Dingya Bao, the house of Bao, temple of Bao Munadu. He built the temple of Bao. It starts off very, very simply, and it starts off like hundreds of brick inscriptions that we have, literally hundreds, maybe thousands, um, written, written by all sorts of rulers over all sorts of a span of time. But it gets a bit more interesting and complicated quite quickly. Um, so we have this prologue about the buildings, building uh, activities he's done. This is quite common in these texts. But then starting in the second paragraph, since the dawn of time, Ever since seeds came forth, in the days before me, the chief boatman appropriated boats. So here's the start of the sad state of affairs that Urukagina is going to reform. Donkeys were appropriated by the chief herdsman. Sheep were appropriated by the chief herdsman. Fishes were appropriated from the fish container by the fisheries inspection. So far, so good, right? This is pretty straightforward. We understand everything that's going on here. It's basically abuse of power, right? We don't understand every single provision at the same level. But he's describing, he's sketching this position, this situation where everybody is taking advantage of, this, of what they shouldn't be taking advantage of. The good of priests paid barley rentals in Ambar. I'm sorry, I can't explain that to you. Um, but the shepherds of wool-bearing sheep paying silver tax, okay, maybe that was unfair. The surveyors, chief lamentation, priests, stewards, brewers, and all overseers paid silver tax on the fleece of suckling lambs. Presumably that was unfair too. Here's more rampant abuse of power. The oxen of the gods plowed the ruler's onion plot. Uh, onion plots actually are very, very important in the third millennium in Mesopotamia. And uh, there's a whole archive of texts at Penn uh, from about 100 years later than this text, maybe less, 50 years later. Um, about onion cropping, and it gave rise actually to one of the, the major intellectual debates in our field where people characterize social history as onionology uh, compared to intellectual history as koyunjikology after the site of Koyunjik where Ashurbani Pal's uh, library was found. On the best fields of the gods were the rulers' onion and cucumber plots. So the rulers, the kings before Urukagina, weren't behaving properly towards the gods. This, this is a detail, you know, we're always trying to read through these texts to understand what they're really saying, right? Because on the surface of it, the words make sense, but what does it really mean? So what this really means is that the former kings weren't behaving in the way they were supposed to towards the gods. They weren't doing their proper divine duty. The temple administrator's barley was allotted to the ruler's troops. Okay. Again, misuse of funds, right? Um, I've been starting to follow the Pandora papers lately. I'm sure some of you have as well. It seems like, you know, plus a change. Um, the temple administrator of something broken regularly exploited for himself the poor mother's garden for wood, weaving baskets from the branches. So again, somebody in power is using something they shouldn't be. When a corpse was buried, the payment was seven pots of beer and two, 420 loaves of bread. Extortionate payments for burial fees. From the border territory of Ningirsu until the sea, there were commissioners acting in the name of the ruler. So the whole land was under the iron boot of the rulers before Urukagana, right? This is the picture that's being painted. These were the customs of former times. Now, this is actually a fantastic little comment in com combination with the others, because very often in, in, in texts from Mesopotamia, we don't get explicit guidance on how we're, we're supposed to understand things. Um, but this is really, really clear, okay? 
And then when Ningirsu, Enlil's warrior, gave the kingship of Lagash to Urukagina, so I took this translation from uh, the electronic text corpus of Sumerian royal inscriptions on uh, Orak, and one of our policies on Orak is we don't enforce uh, particular rules about spellings, and uh, the director of that project likes Irikagina rather than Urukagina, which is fine. Uh, gave the kingship of Lagash to Irikagina, taking him by the hand from among the multitude of people. Then, heeding the commands Ningirsu, his master, gave him, Irikagina replaced the determined fates of former times. So Urukagina is doing this because Ningirsu told him to, essentially. Okay? He's doing it as part of the deal for becoming king. Um, from the, the boats, he removed the chief boatman. From control over the donkeys and sheep, he removed their chief herdsmen. From control over the fish containers, he removed the fisheries inspectors. Over the ruler's household and the ruler's fields, he installed Ningirsu as proprietor. He made the god the controller of all the royal households. Sounds pretty radical, doesn't it? Over the household of the female members of the ruler's family and the fields of the female members of the ruler's family, he installed Bao as proprietor. Bao is Ningirsu's spouse. Over the household of the ruler's children and the fields of the ruler's children, he installed Shulshagana as proprietor. Shulshagana is another member of the Lagash Girsu pantheon. From the territory of Ningirsu, border territory of Ningirsu, until the sea, no one acts in the name of the ruler as commissioner anymore. When a corpse is buried, the payment for him has gone down to three pots of beer and 80 loaves of bread, which is apparently much more reasonable. And this, some new provisions which aren't reflected in the, the first part of the text, the sort of dystopic part of the text. When the house of a royal attendant borders on the house of an important man and that important man says to him, I want to buy it from you. Whether he sells it to him, saying, pay me the silver that satisfies my heart, my house is a large container, fill it with barley for me, or whether he does not sell it to him, the foreman must not become angry with him because of that. So he claims to end coercion and retaliation. He pardoned the citizens of Lagash, the indebted ones, those who stole and those who killed. He released them. Irikagina, Urukagina, made an agreement with Ningirsu that he would not surrender the orphan or the widow to the powerful. So lots and lots of good, you know, well-meaning, uh, beneficent stuff that Urukagina takes credit for. And then, you know, kind of as an afterthought, in the same year, he dredged the little canal and he replaced its former name and extended it into the Idningindu Canal. So a little bit of a, you know, building slash canal digging inscription just to round out the work, which is also interesting because it's a feature of Sumerian textuality in general that usually Things are embedded, one piece is embedded in another piece, something acts as a frame. Here the building inscription and the excavation of the canals, which occurs in other inscriptions, acts as a frame for all of this reform stuff. And to be absolutely clear, this is unique. Nobody has done this before Urukagina, at least in the text that we see. So in that respect, the first reformer is justified based on the data we have. Some things happen like it in, in centuries to come, but not immediately after him. So, on the face of it, Urukagina rights former wrongs and acts in the interests of the citizens of Lagash. He restores uh, all of the royal lands to the gods, which sounds like a real uh, act of, you know, piety, let's say. But it's not quite as simple as it seems, because we have thousands of administrative documents from, Laga, from Girsu primarily, almost all from Girsu, and several hundred of them uh, belong to the records associated with Urukagina's wife, Sasa. And it turns out that Urukagina's wife, Sasa, runs the Bau temple. So returning the royal lands to Bau doesn't really change it very much. It changes it nominally, but the royal family is still controlling the resources. 
And this is important in Mesopotamia because the resources associated with the temple are not destroyed when they're offered. It's not immolation sacrifice. They're redistributed. So basically, everything that comes into the temple, and it's a lot, it gets to be utilized by those who control the temple. In this case, the royal family. And some of these texts are like this one. Um, here's uh, Sasa Dam Urukagina. Um, and this lists textiles. Um, and there are others which uh, list, for example, little basket tags, a number of little basket tags, which list all the fish that fishermen are bringing in for temple offerings and so forth. Um, so I'm not trying to undermine Urukagina completely. It sounds good if he pardoned the citizens of Lagash, right? But some of the things he did, some of the measures he did, actually were covert ways of retaining royal control over the temples. And if you think about it, some of the other things he did also function as ways of exercising power. Simply to write this document, and he's the first ruler that we know who wrote a document like this, asserts his authority to make these rules. There's no authority anymore for local organizations to set these rules. The people who are actually doing the burials don't get to set the price of a burial. The king sets them now. So he's taking that power into himself, and he's, in some senses, kind of restricting the power of other sectors of the economy and society. And the other thing he's doing is he's really trying to align himself in a very very visible way with the god Ningirsu. You know, he's clear that he owes Ningirsu his kingship, and he's trying to establish his uh, fidelity to Ningirsu, presumably as a way of hopefully getting Ningirsu's support. And we know that he needed this, because there's another unique text in the Urukagina corpus. I mean, it's really extraordinary, honestly, that this, this rel relatively short-lived ruler um, has these two incredibly important texts. This is written the same way as an administrative text and an economic document is written. It's not written like a fancy literary text, um, although it certainly is a departure, and whoever wrote it had some ideas on how to create this document, which is in itself interesting. Um, it's about the end of, Luke, of uh, Urukagina's reign just before the end of Urukagina's reign. It's from the moment when Urukagina is still holding on, or trying to hold on. The leader of Umma set fire to boundary levies. He set fire to the Antasura, the temple that was mentioned at the beginning of the Reform Text. He seized all its precious metal and lapis lazuli. He looted the great temple of Tirash, also mentioned in that intro. He looted the Abzu Banda, I'm not gonna read it all. He looted the pedestal of Enlil. So this leader of Umma, runs through the district of Lagash and Girsu, setting fire to everything. He set fire to Inanna's oval, Eanna. He seized all its precious metal and lapis lazuli, destroyed all its statues. Okay? He tore out the barley in the cultivated fields of Ningirsu. Total destruction, right? Having raided Lagash, and this is itself completely novel and, 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 and uh, unprecedented. The leader of Umma surely committed a sin against Ningirsu. This is Urukagina writing a text about how the invader has committed the sins. He raised a hand against him and that hand must be cut off. Urukagina, the king of Girsu, is not capable of punishment. May Nisaba, the personal god of Lugal Zagesi, the ruler of Umma, take the responsibility for the punishment. So this is Urukagina writing to Ningirsu and to, Nin to Nisaba, notionally, right? Saying, Lugal Zagesi has destroyed everything in the land and you need to take care of him because I can't, which in itself is an interesting admission, right? And here's the reverse of that text, just for decoration, but more interestingly, uh, Sebastian Ray's uh, reconstruction of the itinerary of Lugal Zagezi as he runs through, up through, uh, from here, down along this canal, 
and towards Lagash and destroys all of these sanctuaries in the area of Lagash, um, leaving as he, I think slightly speculatively, but perhaps not unreasonably puts it, the area that ur Kagina controls around Girsu. Now it's one thing to have a text like this written by a king who's the victor in a, battle, in a war, but it's totally different to have a text like this which is written in the name of a ruler who's still in his last year or last few years of power, right? So in the course of time, Lugal Zagesi overcomes Urukagina and defeats him. And he sets up in Nippur, in the temple of Enlil, a whole series of carved stone vessels. And they all seem to have the same or essentially the same text on them. And that text is rather like the comment, uh, contains uh, parallels to the comment in the Urukagina reform text. In Urukagina's text, he says, Ningirsu gave me kingship. In this text, Lugal Zagezi says, Enlil gave me kingship over everything. So these guys are expressing their achieving power through the support of different gods. Um, Lugal Zagezi is very much focused on Nippur and Enlil, and Urukagina really emphasized his own local god, Ningirsu, who's characterized as the warrior son of Enlil, um, but it's not a direct approach to Enlil. All of these objects are broken. They're smashed into smithereens. We have drawers full of them in the museum, and we have a few in the Middle East gallery. This piece, these pieces here are, are reconstructed in the Penn Museum. Um, and you can see that what you're looking at, uh, the piece in the middle, is actually the side of the vase, and then you're looking at uh, the section at the two ends. And the, the kind of cream-covered matrix there is restoration to support the gray stone which is inscribed, which is the original material. So it seems as though Lugal Zagezi uh, defeated Urukagina, uh, took, looked to Enlil for legitimation of his rule, and went to Nippur and offered all of these things to Enlil in celebration of his great victory. Okay. Well, I could almost have ended the lecture here because that's the end of Urukagina's story. Um, but I, as I said at the start, I have a soft spot for Lagash and Girsu, and I don't want Lugal Zagesi to have the last word and, in a way, the last laugh, right? We know the reason, probably, why all of these bowls were smashed. And the reason is probably that, as the world turns, Lugal Zagesi got his just desserts after the destruction of Urukagina. This is a tablet, a large tablet, that's in the Middle East galleries, which was written by scribes, or a scribe, let's say around 1750 maybe, plus or minus BCE, in the Enlil courtyard. And this scribe went into the courtyard and stood or sat in front of the statues and the stele that rulers had set up in the Enlil courtyard and copied down the texts. And the very first text on this, on this collection of texts is from a Sargon inscription. Sargon is the first ruler of the dynasty of Akkadai, and it tells how Sargon defeated Lugal Zagesi and led him in a neck stock before Enlil. So Sargon went one further than Lugal Zagesi, we think, Maybe there are other Lugal Zagasi inscriptions to find. And he paraded the defeated ruler in front of the god to make the point, I'm the leading king now. And it gets even better because we have two fragmentary stele, one of which is certainly Sargon, the other which is widely accepted to be Sargon. Here is the first one. And this is nice. It's a some kind of victory stele, it includes battle scenes, and it actually has this image of Sargon on the right-hand side, um, and it says, you can just about make out the writing here, it says Sargon on it, it labels him. So we know this is Sargon, no doubt whatsoever. So Sargon is setting up monuments in the same way 
that, for example, Aonatum did centuries earlier. And I make that point not innocently because this other uh, believed Sargon Stele definitely replicates the imagery of the Stele of the Vultures. It has a net and it has defeated enemies and it has a large figure, which we think is actually Sargon in this case and not Ningirsu. And this individual who's trying to escape, it's been, I think, quite plausibly argued that given the importance of the defeat of Lugar Zagezi in the Sargon inscriptions, and given the, mark, the markers on this individual which mark the individual as a ruler, this is probably Lugal Zagezi trying to escape from Sargon's net. So, I won't say that I take any sort of schadenfreude from this on behalf of Uruk um, but I do think that it's fascinating to think about the way that these uh, historical phenomena are played out in images in this way. And so I leave you with a shot, another shot from Ray's book of uh, Tello today, because even Sargon, of course, couldn't last forever. Thank you. <laughs>